been around now for about a little over a decade um, in some way, shape, or form. And we'll get into kind of the, the milestones along the way. But the idea that, uh, that where this came from was trying to connect the academic research resources with the athletic resources and see how we could address concepts, topics, issues that are important to the UW know, athletes, student athletes, coaches, sports medicine staff, as well as what would advance our knowledge in all of those fields uh, with respect to the science. And so we've kind of put a timeline together and try to walk through different milestones. And it was about in 20, 2009, I think, was the first conversation that Doug and Benny and myself had. And then eventually 2010 is where we started to put some sort of concept and, and formalize it a little bit as to what this could look like uh, in terms of how we would try to integrate those two sides, take some of the research and science from the UW academics arm and connect it with the sports medicine side. Knowing that other universities have tried to do exactly this, right? You look at other institutions, for example, Duke has the K lab. Uh, but then importantly, that's outside of their athletics arm. That's within their academics arm. They don't have it integrated within athletics. Stanford, similarly, had, uh, has their athletic performance lab in the academic side, not in the athletic side. And so when athletics wanted to access it, they were having to pay wait list all of these issues in order to get their tests done. And their tests weren't necessarily designed with the athletics coaches and the student athletes in mind. And so one of our goals was to try to address those, overcome those, and develop a truly integrated uh, lab program, if you will, that tried to work with those two sides and develop it in a way that both addressed programmatic issues within the athletics arm, but also addressed research issues within the, the mission of the university. And so again, the goal behind it was to be a leader within collegiate athletic performance testing. And we had a variety of ways in which we we're gonna define and, and achieve that, that goal. And when with the, with the idea in mind that the information needed to be important and used in the short term and even in the immediate term to our student athletes in the program with athletics, but that the information was still viable and important to be able to reach the greater audience and contribute to professional and scientific knowledge. So in 2013, when, which was about when McLean was redesigned and the space was remade and we had new access to be able to integrate all of these resources, this was where we really were for, first defined with our footprint as our, our lab space downstairs, right? as our Badger Athletic Performance Lab. Now as a program, we had existed before that. In those intermediate three years, we would bring student athletes out to the research park laboratory that we had on, in, in sports medicine, over to University Station to get DEXA scans, cross the, the mall here over to an engineering to get a few other tests done. And it was hard. It was, it was a challenge, right? It's a pain in the butt to schlep people around to those locations. Having it integrated on site made a huge, huge difference, huge effect. And this is also the time where we began to expand our personnel. Right? We brought in additional people to be able to do more testing, be able to handle the bandwidth of how we were going to be able to achieve this. In those early years, we, we started out with one team that was wrestling. And from wrestling, we expanded into more at teams as we were able to take it on, as we could take bandwidth, because we had personnel and resources to make it work. Having this space downstairs in McLean, next to athletic training facilities with football locker rooms, soccer locker rooms, Olympic training sports, Olympic uh, weightlifting, near strength conditioning nearby. All of that was critical for us to be able to achieve some of the growth and the integration that we were looking for. And so again, a lot of the tests that we were doing where we have our DEXA scans where we can do body composition analysis, bone mineral density testing, postural analysis, looking at their ability to control movement pre-post injury, pre-post surgery. Some performance analysis, like looking at counter movement, jump in a variety of different ways. We use as a baseline assessment on many of the sports and the athletes. And then we can look at whole body running mechanics and a variety of other running or movement mechanics as well. But running became an area that we really wanted to focus on, at least initially. 2016, then, we continued to grow with personnel. We had a number of other individuals that joined our team. Jen finally got a break from some of her testing because <laughs> she was doing a, a tremendous amount of it, as was Mikel at that time. 
Uh, and we were able to bring on, again, we were able to expand our test volume to about 600 athletes per year. Uh, when you consider we have a little over 800 athletes, it's a, it's a pretty big number in terms of how many times we're testing them and testing them two to three times per year. Some teams even were looking at four times per year for testing. So the volume was quite high. And of course, this, this created a tremendous data set, right? Not only was it information that we could turn around back to the coaches and the athletes, but it was also giving us longitudinal data. How were programs evolving over time? How were programs metrics changing based upon what they were doing training wise? How were certain athletes with a particular injury responding and getting back on the field? Those were all things that we were able to start addressing. And within that research arm, and within the sports medicine arm in particular, we were very interested in running games and injury. And now we finally had a data set, a really novel data set that was large enough to start answering questions, in particular related to bone stress injuries. What are factors related to bone stress injuries in distance runners? What are risk factors that we can look for in advance of the injury to try to make some changes both in their training habits as well as identify those that might be at risk? Muscle tendon injuries, hamstring injuries. Last uh, semester we talked on that. That's an, uh, an area of, of, uh, of research that we're continuing on, as well as tendon injuries, looking at tendinopathy and recovery from those injuries. Post surgical recovery after an ACL reconstruction, after a femoral acetabular impingement, after labral repairs, after sports hernias, a number of injuries that we now have a, a good data set where we can track recovery at specific milestones. At four months after surgery, is the athlete on track to where they should be? Or do we need to emphasize certain areas so they, so they can get back on the field in a timely way? Are there other things we need to be thinking about? In addition, we have a very uniqueness because of many of our athletes are tested before injury, when they come in as freshmen or even annually, we also have a pre-injury baseline for them. We know what they look like before they got injured. So now we understand, are they, ever, are they getting back to their pre-injury state? Or was aspects of their pre-injury state maybe contributing to their injury risk to begin with? And so now we can help improve, we can help identify that in future student athletes that come through as a potential uh, injury risk identifier. Athlete well-being, looking at mindfulness, obviously is part of it, looking at anxiety, depression, overall sleep quality, all of those aspects are being measured on a routine basis, physical well-being, mental well-being, become a, a certain uh, important metrics that we bring into to the recording. Concussion, a long-standing program. Dr. Brooks, I think she spoke at this at this group in the past, has been a long time pro, uh, uh, area of study, and it continues to be an area of study. Dr. Colby is now leading a program that's integrated with the NFL and NCAA on mouth guard and looking at how it addresses head accelerations. So this is an ongoing area of work that we've continued to expand. And all of that work has led to a pretty decent chunk of publications and presentations that are coming directly out of the Badger Athletic Performance data set. In 2017, that's when we got our first multi-year external grant to, uh, that leveraged the infrastructure that we had within BAP. In other words, it leveraged our resources, our facilities, our integration within the UW Athletics. And we were able to use this to start begin to, to develop a, a monitoring program for hamstring strain injuries and to see what factors may be playing a, a role with it, how we might be able to better identify the readiness to return to play. And this was supported through a, a collaborative uh, grant from the NBA and G Healthcare that allowed us to, to again define whether we could identify those who might be at risk for injury based upon certain measures such as strength and then also determining readiness to return to play by looking at their MRI characteristics at the time they're ready to go back to play, looking at strength characteristics. 2018 then we started to have, again, we had continued growth in our, our personnel and our infrastructure. Then we began to get interest from outside organizations, outside groups that were looking to say, hey, can we tap into what you guys are doing? Can we, can we partner? Because where your strengths are, what you guys are doing is something that's important to us as organizations, whether it's industry or other sports. There's a company out of the UK called Rayon Labs who's developing a very cool uh, energy absorbing polymer. And uh, Dr. Jack Martin's leading that line with us 
on how we can integrate that with being able to address whether it becomes new athletic performance apparel, whether it's safety equipment, or whether it's other aspects that might be uh, integrated into sports equipment overall. We've been doing some work with different professional organizations. Uh, the Toronto Blue Jays occasionally send athletes up, for example, for us to test as part of our return to play characteristics. We're gonna be heading down there in a couple of weeks to do some performance analysis on a handful of their athletes as a way of eventually developing a, a program that they want to evolve into at an organizational level. And we've had continued exposure and interest from uh, several other clubs along those same lines. And then just recently, as I mentioned, we now are one of the founding sites of an NFL NCAA collaboration. We're going to be entering year two. That'll be starting July 1st uh, with the goal of expanding this on a continual basis. Uh, there is not, a, at this point, any. they, they want to make this somewhat of a, of a growing and evolving collaboration focused initially on concussion research, but expanding into more extremity uh, and other soft tissue type of injuries. So again, overall, our growth over that last decade, I think is where we started from with was a handful of people uh, cobbling together a few spaces. We got the, the trust from the administration, both in athletics, as well as the School of Medicine and Public Health to be able to commit to us and our vision. And I think we've been able to achieve a decent amount of that in that period of time. How have the student athletes directly benefited from this? Well, we've got, we've got, there's a few ways. One, Jen has done a great job in developing an interactive viewer of individual performance metrics of each athlete over time. Um, and that's using the, the Tableau interface. So this information now, all the metrics that we collect is put up on a dashboard where certain users can access it and be able to see individual athletes' data, how they've evolved over time and changed. One team, potentially, what are the team averages? What are the, how do the teams change by year? and be able to see how those metrics might influence either performance, the coaches are looking at it and interpreting it that way, and with the lens of how can I modify my training and did it achieve what I wanted it to achieve? Or from a sports medicine standpoint, do we see anything here that we need to be thinking about from the standpoint of injury prevention, injury recovery? We've also, with the funding that we've received, been able to turn that back into equipment purchases, that we've been able to expand our testing uh, protocols. So we have a number of different devices where we can test uh, hamstring eccentric strength, for example, which is uh, a suspected risk factor for hamstring strain injuries. We've got a number of other test devices as well that we utilize for muscle strength. We've been able to purchase uh, double the number of catapult sensors that, that football currently uses. The university originally had 50. We've been able to expand that to 90 uh, using uh, the resources that we've had through our research arm. In addition, we have sensors now that we can measure movement analysis on athletes on the field or on the court. Using a multi-sensor IMU setup, uh, we're able to record the athletes while they're in their field of play, doing tasks that they would do as part of their game and be able to measure how their movement is, what their joint kinematics are, and understand that as it might relate to injury or potentially for performance. From a standpoint of care for the student athlete, we have uh, a, a variety of post-injury testing and guides to rehab and return to sport that's evolved out of the data set. So again, we capture these data routinely to, to, as milestones of recovery, but it's important for that information to get back to the student athlete, to get back to the sports medicine staff. And so we've created like well, basically, which is again, a, a dashboard or a, a one page synthesis of all that information of metrics that are important to them to judge where they are in their recovery so, for example, after an ACL reconstruction, they may be measured at four months, six months, eight months, return to play. And we can see a progressive change in what those metrics look like relative to what we would anticipate. And to give the athlete confidence that they are seeing the changes that they need to, to perform on the field. We've evolved a couple of, or several, or a few new novel patient care clinics. So one is our sleep clinic uh, that, that Dr. John Gopp from the School of Pharmacy, who's a member of our Bachelor of Performance Program. He comes on site down to McLean a few hours each week and works for our student athletes to address any sort of sleep-related habits. Dr. Colby works in our muscle recovery clinic to make sure that after, especially after surgery, that, they don't, that the individual muscles are fully functioning at their maximum level, that they're getting a full return of the key muscles, such as the quadricep muscles after ACL reconstruction, which can oftentimes be a challenge to recover. 
And then myself, I have a few hours each week looking at movement retraining. We know that it's not just the aspect of uh, restoring the capacity of each muscle, but it's also many times having to reteach the athlete how to move after a sustained period of time of from sport, like an ACL reconstruction. We end up developing what's called the learned disuse pattern that we need to just do a few tweaking to get them back to move in a, in a more performing manner. And then lastly, we've been able to, again, with our research uh, purchases, or research uh, funding, be able to return that back in certain technology that can be used to expand our diagnostic and therapeutic equipment, such as diagnostic ultrasound, uh, as well as shockwave uh, for the purposes of muscle tendon type injuries. Where are we heading next? I don't know. <laughs> That's what I want to talk about. Where are we heading next? We've got ideas what we could do next, but now we want to think about what, what makes the most sense. So one area that I'm, we're very keen about doing is, we, again, we're at a point where we can expand our testing, we can redefine it. In the early years, because of bandwidth and resources, we had to kind of a, a one-size-fits-all approach to our testing. Every team more or less had to do the same sort of testing. We just didn't have the ability to customize it. We didn't have the, the resources. We're getting that. We now have the ability where we can start to do more more sports specific testing, work with our strength coaches, work with the coaches to see what it is that they're interested in, what metrics would be most important to them, and then customize our, our preseason and, uh, and in season measurements to best reflect that to create the most useful information possible. Second area is we, we've improved our measurements and our technologies. We now have the ability to go on field and on court in many ways. And so we can actually do some of our measurements, not just downstairs in the claim, but bring our measurements out to each facility site and do more on-field testing. And I think that'll be a key area for us to be able to expand into uh, moving forward. This one I think is absolutely paramount. We need to expand our data analytics. We have a tremendous amount of data. We have over a decade's worth of data. When you think about 600 student athletes tested twice a year in a number of areas that we're testing them in, it's a tremendous data set. And we're only beginning to be able to uh, pull out information and use it in a meaningful way. There's a, a tremendous amount that's buried within there yet that I think we need to tap into. Bringing on data scientists, data computer scientists, data analytics individuals to be able to really mine that data. And in a way that's in a meaningful way, not just as, a, as an academic exercise, but something that actually feeds back into program development, uh, I think is absolutely critical to where we're, where we're at now. Another area that I think is, is right for us to consider is developing a resource for our alum. So when the student athletes are here, we do quite a bit of testing for them. We develop a really nice digital athlete while they're here. But then of course, they graduate and they're always an alum of the university, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years later. Let's look at the effect of their performance as a student athlete. What do they look like 10 years later? What about those who had an ACL reconstruction? What's their quality of life 20 years, 30 years down the road? What did their, their, their well being in middle age compare to when they were a student athlete? This is a, a, an area that I think we could really expand on. Uh, if you remember last, uh, I think it was last fall, a professor from um, Marquette University, Jacob Kaplan, came and talked about some research he was doing looking at the, the, uh, the aging collegiate student athlete, and this is an area that he wants to tap into. I think we are ripe to be able to contribute greatly in that area. I'd also like to work with our high school athletes. Sorry, not high school athletes, high schoolers our high school individuals and develop a summer research program for both high schools in the area to promote STEM, STEM program development, as well as even our undergraduates develop some sort of a paid internship for our research to be able to participate within Badger Athletic Performance. We want, definitely want to contribute and give back to the community. And I think working in our high school and middle schools in particular uh, to promote STEM would be a really, really nice way to do it. And then lastly, I think, again, working with our, our different collaborators, we have the potential ability to start thinking about developing a pilot competitive research program for campus. 
wouldn't it be cool if we decided an area that we wanted campus to try to help us answer? Incredibly smart people over there that we're not even beginning to tap into that we can certainly do if we can define an area and have them compete for that funding. Now, again, we're not talking NIH level dollars. We can make it small dollars, but they would still be very competitive and we can be very likely get some very strong uh, proposals out of that work. All of that with the concept of potentially thinking about, is, it, is the timing right for us to move toward a center? And be thinking of Badger Athletic Performance Program as a center for the healthy athlete, for example. Thinking about all the different pieces we've talked about, about community, education, research, the athletics arm, industry, professional organizations, all being represented in it. We tick every box that campus asked for when it comes to being identified as a center. We have sustained funding. We have personnel, we have multidisciplines involved, and we have a need on campus and in the general community for this. Huge list of individuals that have been involved. These are, are, all, are many of them. And unfortunately, I'm probably leaving some off the list. Uh, not intentionally, by no means, but our lab group, our partners, of course, within sports medicine and strength and conditioning, our collaborators across campus. Our extra collaborators are global. Uh, many are overseas. <coughs> our alums, undergraduate and graduate alums who have done various projects at a semester level, year-long levels. And of course, Denny Hellwig for his initial vision and working with us to make this goal achievable. Have to acknowledge all of our support that's come from different groups. DJO Global was one of the first. They gave us an initial gift to make this happen back in 2010, 2011, I think it was. So they saw the vision, they saw what could come from it. And then from there, we've been able to expand and grow and, and we're continuing to see growth at a, at a, a good pace. Thank you, I appreciate your time. Um, we can open it up to any questions that people may have. Potentially kept it short, hoping there would be good questions and discussions. So let them fly. Trying to describe the difference in terms of like what being a center would mean compared to what the current situation is. Yeah, that's a good question. So on this campus, the term center and institute are you have to apply basically to use either of those words. Right, you have to achieve certain certain benchmarks in order for campus to allow you to use those specific terminology. They are they are protected terms and they're ones that are that are respected by Baskin by campus. So by being a center, does that mean Baskin gives us a blank check to be able to do no? <laughs> they don't, you really don't get any funding necessarily. But what it does allow you to do is create, it does give you different resources on campus, number one, that you can tap into. Two, faculty can be have appointments within a center. That can become part of their effort allocation to within a center. So that becomes a distinct piece to it. Three, there's also the potential to even integrate part of the healthcare organization through UW Health into that center as well. So it, it provides the potential for better, even more growth than where we're at now than just being at a level of what we call a program. Good question. Brian, can you describe a little bit of the work that you've done with the NFL and how you've seen hopefully some of that filter in down to what we're able to come up with? Yeah, for sure. So, like, for example, with the NFL, we'll start with the hamstring strain injury study, for example. I'm sorry, or even you're working on the soft tissue advisory. Oh, the soft tissue advisory. Yeah, sure. So, for, yeah, so what Michael's referring to that in the last few years, I've been part of their soft tissue injury task force with the NFL and being able to take information of what the NFL is using. So, they're the NFL level is doing very much what we're describing here in terms of data analytics on all the athletes that are all being centralized in the league office. They're looking to do injury prediction, injury recovery, uh, and not only from a standpoint of some of the metrics we're using, but also you know, looking at training habits. What, how, many, how many days per week are they practicing? What's the intensity? What's the effort? How much time on field at a certain effort level versus lower effort levels? 
and from those try to make recommendations on training uh, uh, rules. So, for example, last year, you know, they, they described how you needed to uh, acclimate. Uh, the number of days of acclimation at the beginning of, of camp was modified and how many, how many days consecutively you could have before you had to have a day off. So they're, they're trying to use that to provide scientific data back to the coaches and let the coaches make that decision. We're not, we're not dictating anything. We're only making recommendations saying this is what the data suggests. Does it make sense based upon uh, uh, from, a, from a coaching perspective? I think there, that is a model that we could think about. Again, providing more. This is where it kind of goes back to getting to, to sports-specific metrics. If we can do that and give the coaches, uh, the uh, athletic training staff, the key information that they find valuable, I think we can now begin to hopefully help them develop programs in a way that benefits the student athlete. We have a question from um, the group online. What specifically has the lab been able to do with the Blue Jays and what do you hope to do moving forward with MLB clubs? Yeah, so a good question. Um, so with the, the Blue Jays, they're, they're really interested, again, in a lot of the work that we've done in the area of hamstring strain injuries. So in MLB, uh, hamstring strain injuries, again, are one of the top two, top three musculoskeletal injuries that they face. Um, and in fact, this past year was, was really... Uh, hard thing on, on many of the clubs. And so they're looking for us to be able to work with them on developing a program to reduce those, those injury risks, not only in terms of identifying those that might be at risk, but more importantly, trying to minimize their re-injury risk and the re-injury occurrences that are happening. By coming on site with many of our on-field testing, so we're going to take our, our sensors, our, our, uh, our on-field sensors that we have to measure joint kinematics, record their sprint mechanics from home plate, you know, through first base, for example. We'll be doing some MRI measurements, looking at muscle volume, muscle characteristics, to see if we can identify, again, individuals that uh, may be at greater risk for those injuries, and then follow them over the course of the season. So it's just a pilot program. We're doing it for about a dozen of their players uh, over the next month. And then depending on how that evolves and, and how much help we're able to provide for them, they want to expand that to a bigger scale next fall. Other questions? Well, thank you. Everyone. Oh, yeah. What do you see as the biggest challenge at this point for becoming a I think the biggest challenge is, well, that's a good question, actually. I'm not sure. I think from the check, checking all the boxes, we have to sustain funding. So obviously, we need to make sure that that continues, and I don't see that ending well. Um, it's, we have the integrated uh, aspects across campus. We can absolutely justify the need. I don't, I don't really see there being a, a major hurdle to getting that next step. You know, one of the pieces in order for us to be able to do what we want to do and be able to expand in the way we describe, space is an issue, right? We're already bursting within the space that we have and we're pushing the limits on that. That's going to need to be something that we, we have to address eventually is the space allocation that we have and how, how we're able to get, make these measurements uh, in a way that... Um, we can that we can do so without compromising our ability to turn the data around as quickly as we currently can back to the teams. I also want yeah when you started my twelve years ago, how different is the current situation from what your vision was at that time? Is this what you envisioned, or was it something different? Oh, that's a really good question. I have to actually think, I have to think back to what I was thinking at the time. Um, I, I actually I think I think we've done better. I think we've exceeded, honestly. I think, Jen, I mean, you can you you were brought on shortly after those initial conversations. I think we thought about where we were going to be in a decade. I think we would have hoped to get half as far as we thought. I think would have been would have been would have been great. You know, for us to get the the recognition from the NBA, MLB, NFL and all wanting to be able to be players in what we're doing, I, I, not, I would not have thought that was possible or would have been achieved. So I think we've done better. <laughs> the part of that and part of being able to make those connections is how things are integrated within that part. It totally is. 
you know, I've, I've had the opportunity from that research arm when I've been invited to different campuses or conferences to give um, a presentation on a particular research topic. As soon as we show them the art integration, that is the one thing that every university follows up with me and asks, how did you pull that off? We have never been able to get that type of integration to happen on our campus. It just doesn't fly. You know, there's always that wall that develops and it comes down to the individuals and the people and the personnel. It was, I mean, it was a timing issue, right? It was, we had a, a conversation between individuals that were like-minded and there was a, a renovation happening at the same time, space allocation, people, people saw the, the potential for it. Um, and I think that, that made it pretty unique to the point that it's, yeah, a lot of other campuses have struggled with it. And in fact, some, a few more in the Big Ten in the last six months or so have reached out saying, how did, you, how did you make this happen? What are areas that we could do to improve on this? What are some ways that we could expand? You know, they've got, they all have examples of one-off collaborations or, you know, a team works with one individual on campus for a year or two, but not to the level that we've, we've done it. And I think the strength of that has been because we haven't approached this as a research program. It's not a research program. It's a program. It is an athletic performance program that we take research out of and are able to publish from because we collect it in a rigorous way. But it's, we turn that data around timely, right? We, we, the goal is that we collect data that we can turn back around to the teams and the athletes in a very short time frame. Most other universities work under the model of Oh yeah, somebody on campus has a particular expertise or lab setting. I can go over there and collect data. Well, there, that model is graduate students and postdocs who are used to a month or two months of working on the data and then turning something back around. Much slower timeline. So we we approach this as a service, as a program that we can also be able to do research. We um, so. Let's just look out like 10 years from now, yeah. 15 years from now, the space we're in right now where student athletes are wanting to have more control over, I'll use the word name image and likeness, but like their, their information, their data, their likeness, all that kind of stuff. Has there been any conversation around that being a potential threat to, I'm just going to go ahead and claim a center, the center being able to do this type of work, like to be able to use their their information to yeah. research and publish, but like, I'm not getting anything out of that, but yet the center is getting something out of that. Yeah. How is, how is that playing? That's a really good question. And to be honest, no, with that discussion hasn't happened as of yet. It's something that certainly we need to be thinking about. You know, importantly, the information that that is used whenever it's published is always an aggregate. It's never an individual's information that's presented as that individual. It's always a collection of, you know, 100 or 200 or 300 individuals' data points. Um, so, there, yeah, we're not, we're not selectively identifying any individual, but you're right, their metrics are contributing to that, much like it would if, if they went to um, the hospital or to a, a medical center, had imaging done, and later those records were extracted as part of a publication to understand it in a very similar way to that. Yeah. That's, that's a, a point that we will definitely need to address. We started looking at a few platforms that uh, can store some of the data and make it accessible to more people. Um, I think that's one of the things we're trying to do partly why um, being able to more people to access specific data points, whether it's really for academics or anything else. Um, so they can work closer with the athletes themselves, right? Like, and one of the things with that is sometimes allowing the athletes direct access to some of their performance metrics too. And I think we've started seeing, and there's been a few, uh, as some of our uh, NFL prospects have gone to play different games and posting with more groups that are the same age. Why don't you see if you can get all of your catapult data for the past four years and you want to be able to take a look at that and help you. But I the request for that type of data is going to be more prominent. Yeah, you know, for a lot of our student athletes, it's you look at like tangible and actual data. Like a lot of times, like sports specific data that are grabbing from like on field stuff, they really have no say in how that is going to help 
you know, develop the next day's practice. A lot of it goes to the coaches because the coaches are the ones that are developing the drills and the sessions and things like that. But some of our wellness data, I think that's very actionable with them, helping educate them to understand like what we've seen like three or four days before sleep. Let's just sit down and have a conversation. They're privy to that information. But then again, it's education and connecting them with the people that are, you know, within our spaces that can answer those questions. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you.